Welcome to the Wizards of Amazon podcast where we cover all things private label. My name is Carlos Alvarez and I'm going to be your host for the show. Today I have an amazing guest, Chris McCabe on the show. Chris, what's up? Hey, nice to see you. How are you? <laughs> Perfect. It's the first time we're, we're seeing each other. I mean, we're recording this, but we can actually see each other on Zoom. That's but right. I've heard you on a bazillion other podcasts and social media everywhere. I want to even say some events that I've gone to. Okay. Um, yep. So. Prospero and. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say one of the most amazing things I heard and see if I get this right, was that you worked in seller performance in Amazon. Right. So we're still, we're still the only firm that's got, I mean, it's not just me, it's my whole squad. We're all ex Amazon and we all worked on those, um, they call it merchant risk investigation teams, but that's just the umbrella of all investigative activities that include what is commonly known as seller performance. So um, I did that for several years and, uh, others that work with me did it for more years. So, I mean, we're really, we're really, uh, particular about how we interpret certain policies and how they're enforced and how we think sellers should communicate with our former teams based on that experience. And the team members you have, I didn't know that. I thought it was just you as far as the, the yeah. seller performance connection, uh, currently still work in seller performance or these are ex-seller performance? No, no, no. Yeah, no, these are all ex-Amazonians. Um, if you go to my, if you go to the e-commerce Chris website under um, the, on the about page, there's a bit about me and my background consulting sellers. Um, I've had some people that I've worked with for a few years and others are more recent um, additions to the teams, but the client facing work, the client side is all uh, done by people who have worked at the company. Definitely. I've, I've always known you to be one of the good guys in the industry, even though we haven't been, we haven't had to connect. Uh, I, I think what sort of prompted this was I had a few, um, well, Alexis won't mind me mentioning his name, but a, a yeah. few friends of mine that the, they, they were having some issues. They went through the, the normal route with a lot of the popular names mm -hmm. in, in getting some stuff resolved. And it was known as, it, it was considered unresolvable. <laughs> they, they went to you and it quickly got resolved. So I'm like, okay, Chris McCabe, the magician is what I'm saying. So I was hopefully, like, I have to get yeah. him on the show. Hopefully we're among the popular names as well at this point. We've been, yeah, 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 no, definitely. Yeah. We've been doing it longer than anyone except for, I guess, Cynthia Stein. So, um, yeah, 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 no, definitely one of the popular names it's just in the, in my meetup group, there, there tends to be a, a yeah. like an echo chamber, if that's the word, like you yeah. get, one good result and then that's the only name you hear for a little while and yeah. yeah i mean maybe that's a good it's worthwhile to preface the conversation we're about to have today just about um fact checking things being really heavy in the research before you hire outside help or before you even decide yourself how to deal with a performance notification instead of the knee-jerk reaction where you know you just copy and paste something somebody else says that they had the same exact situation and I use this person. Um, there's a lot of promotion. There's a lot of people marketing themselves heavily. It doesn't necessarily mean that they understand. I mean, you probably understand we as former Amazonians hear stuff out there all the time and we just wince because we don't know why those myths are being spread as they are. Um, I've learned over the last couple of years they're being spread because people are crea <laughs> creating YouTube videos around it or posting on Facebook because they have to sound knowledgeable, right? Um, they have sort of like an insecurity complex about their lack of background in Amazon. So they have to kind of make it look like they understand these issues. Um, if they can be effective, I'm all for it. Right. Um, but a lot of times, like you said, they come back and it's unresolvable quote unquote, we don't necessarily agree with unresolvable unless we encounter the same problems when we're trying to troubleshoot the problem. Yeah, well said. I, I've been, I've been a full-time seller now over 14 years. So I've obviously dealt with, wow. um, I, I've made mistakes well, yeah. through ignorance, sometimes not treating it as a business in the beginning and, and just made some mistakes. So I've, sure. I've, run, I've run a file of seller performance before and had to deal with them. It's always, uh, uh, it always makes you clench. You know, you're always uh, super concerned, but of course. I figured at this point, I sort of knew all the good advice to give. And in mm -hmm. our first call, before we get into the topic, you actually, uh, corrected me on something. And after the call, I'm like, wow, I, I've, I've been giving out inadvertently some, some not so great advice. And that had to do with the, the rise of um, identity issues and getting accounts open. Yeah. And my, I guess out of frustration and definitely ignorance, um, I was just like, well, you know what? Squeakiest wheel gets the oil. You need to just keep resubmitting. Yeah. And, and you pointed out some good points. I'm thinking it would be a podcast in and of itself um, on 
on why that's really not a good idea. <laughs> and yeah. You're resubmitting um, to counter a performance notification or do you mean like an ACE and suspension that you're trying to get reinstated? Uh, no, this is just to get your account open. Uh, oh, accounts. Yeah. 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 Um, especially with verification cases. Um, those are low level, poorly trained teams that don't really care. Uh, it's a lower priority for the entire company to deal with registration failures and verification issues. Um, they've just decided that in certain, for certain teams, executing those tasks doesn't have to be something that they refer to a manager level for review. You can try to get it to be manager level by escalating it properly, but uh, if you haven't even sold before, and on top of that, they can't verify some of the information or your documents are inconsistent, then they're even less motivated. And then on top of that, if you keep sending the same thing over and over, or what you said, like submitting you know the same thing more times because you don't get a response a lot of times they know you're they're not intending to respond they know you're sending the same thing that gives them a reason not to respond and it's just self-perpetuating at that point and yeah it's it's it's, it's yeah. it makes total sense and that just goes to show how even with good intentions and thinking you know something like in my case um and once you said that, I, I had to get up in my meetup group and retract it. I even mentioned, I was like, look, I just spoke to Chris and like, you footnoted me. <laughs> I did. I did. I was like, Hey, we get, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this person in here to speak at the meetup group, which I'm still hoping we ha that happens after this uh, COVID-19 scare. It blows over. Yeah. yeah. But um, no, great advice. Uh, the topic today, I mean, again, there's a bazillion topics we could actually have standalone podcasts on. And I'm, I'm sure this is not the last time you're going to be on the show, but let me, let me explain a little bit. So I, Again, selling for as long as I have, one of the models I used to use to sell on was what I call the wholesale model on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And it was this super genius strategy. I would just find these brands. I can open an account with them. They weren't really thinking Amazon back then mm -hmm. when someone opened an account. So I could sell their products willy-nilly, keep reordering. And I'd get messages on the buyer-seller message board like, hey, who are you? Yeah. Um, and... I was like, well, you know what? They can't do anything. I'm buying the product. I'm buying it legit. I have invoices. I can just keep selling. But then every now and then one brand would get a little doing air quotes here savvy and they'd, they'd, they'd make up a fake counterfeit claim. Right. And I knew it was legit, but it seemed to be successful for them in getting me off of the listing. Mm -hmm. uh, fast forward a decade and this is happening a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost like, look, if you're going to sell wholesale, like you just need to come out and tell these people like, this is what's going on. Otherwise yeah. their reaction is going to be this. Okay, can you tell me about that and what you're seeing regarding that? I definitely recommend what you just said. And it just shows your 14 years of experience coming right out because that's exactly the transition that's happened. Um, can you successfully defeat a fake counterfeit complaint, even if it is from the brand and you confirm it's in the brand? Yes, you should be able to. And if notice teams ignore you, you need to dispute it and escalate it until you successfully uh, turn that, turn that trade ca uh, claim away. But in the meantime, you don't want to have be a reseller, for instance, of major brands and have all these brands coming down on you at the same time with these kinds of claims. You know you'll get suspended, right? Um, and it takes time to sort it out. You might get reinstated. We reinstate people who are accused of this type of thing all the time. But it's not, it's not the next day necessarily. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. It can be a very painful process sure. of, of sorting out, you know, notice teams love to bounce you back to the brand. Hey, you know, even if there's no test order from the brand that supposedly proves you, you sold a counterfeit version of that product, they love to send the message that says you haven't addressed the claim we've received from the rights owner. Go back to the rights owner, get the retraction from the rights owner. Well, obviously if the rights owner is trying to knock you off a listing, or even trying to get you suspended, they're not necessarily going to retract the claim um, or help you out in any way. And essentially that's what you need is their help because a plan of action may not be enough. They might want the retractions plus the plan of action. And in the old days, like you said, the way it used to be was, oh, you're accused of counterfeit. Here's my invoice. These items are purchased new. It's within the last year. And you'd get that listing reinstated. I mean, that was true even in, well into 2019. Um, today, what we see is lots of people just getting the generic can messaging back from notice saying, this hasn't sufficiently proven that you weren't selling counterfeit, go back to the brand, or show us an authenticity letter to go with the invoice. They're, they're, very, um, they're very full up on this idea of you've got to prove it beyond just the, the invoice that shows that you sourced it from a reliable place. So um, it's just gotten very 
confusing on their side too, because they're extremely inconsistent in how they respond to these. Um, and, and I don't totally understand the whole authenticity uh, yeah. part of it. Like what, what are they asking for even in that regard? So either a buyer or a brand accused you of counterfeit. I mean, sometimes buyers just use those buzzwords, right? I think this is a different item. I think it's fake. Um, the packaging doesn't look the same as last time. I think this is counterfeit or fake. So those are just automation triggers. And then somebody looks at it and sends you a request. They don't necessarily take the listings away immediately. They might just say, you got to send us an invoice to keep this listing. Um, so it's not even really a soft block at that point. Uh, they used to delete your listings and say, you can relist this yourself, but we want to see an invoice. Now, sometimes they don't even take the listing down, right? They just want the invoice. But what I recommend to people is come back with the invoice and an authenticity letter, at least from the supplier, or if it's not from the brand. Not an authorization letter. Two totally, this is one of the myths that these are the exact same thing, a letter of authorization versus an authenticity letter. And Amazon propagates that myth by alternating which one they ask for um with very unclear messaging but authenticity letters are something from your supplier on company letterhead that talks about how long they've been in business with you hopefully talks about their relationship back to the brand ideally they're an authorized distributor um and they can talk about the quantities that you've been buying from them in the past and the fact that they are reachable by phone to confirm that you are a legitimate client of theirs Okay. So, I mean, this, this is affecting more like in my example, I'm talking about wholesaling, mm -hmm. but the arbitrage sellers as well. So like most times they're not accepting receipts from, from stores. And then even when you get past that, even if you could show something, the brands themselves, if they go the route of this uh, counterfeit, it's counterfeit and they just take two pictures and they show arrows going to nonsense. Yeah. And yeah. You lose your account. Um, yes. What? This seems to be getting worse. Where else do you see, um, how much further do you see this going? And well, is it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so there are brands that are, I mean, the contacts are from the brands or their legal departments or their brand protection agencies, which is a whole other you know, situation. But the brands themselves are making fake counterfeit complaints. And then there are fake counterfeit complaints that aren't from brands that are from some other party just trying to exploit the chaos and the opportunity of, of the, notice teams being entirely disorganized, right? By submitting something that's not even from the brand. So if you're accused by another seller of counterfeit, just because they're on the same listing as you and they're trying to knock you off, then you still need to get that letter from the brand that says you're selling products that you bought from a legitimate source. Not, not a lot of people do that or know how to do that. Um, and unfortunately, that's the best way to get it resolved, at least putting that letter from the brand in front of Amazon because Amazon doesn't necessarily vet these complaints for veracity, even if it's from what looks like a seller or a fake email address, right? They're rubber stamping them as a oh, counterfeit complaint. We better put the burden on this reseller to show us they've got legitimate sourcing instead of saying this is an obvious BS complaint that doesn't hold water. It's from a QQ or some random email address that doesn't even exist if you send an email there. Um, I mean, that's kind of scary, right? If, if an email address, that bounces, right? You write to them trying to resolve it and get a retraction and you get a bounce. Why would that be considered a legitimate IP claim whatsoever? Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So arbitrage wholesale, it's like, okay, you know, this is a private label podcast. I'm predominantly a private label seller. So, oh, what? I don't have to worry about that stuff. But lately, yeah. yes. So lately, and I'm involved in a lot of other groups as I'm sure you are. And yeah. one of them is, uh, it's not a very above board group, but I'm there really just to see what's going on. Oh, and, of course. and it's almost a strategy. It's almost put in course format, you know, three mm -hmm. weeks before prime day or right before a major holiday. Um, they're these templates to basically accuse, uh, we'll use me as an example. Mm -hmm. Someone will accuse me of selling counterfeit of my private label product that I have brand registry of. Yep. Are you seeing more of that? Oh yeah. Oh, that's, that's gone up, I don't know, tenfold since 2018. Um, people realized finally that, hey, I can accuse a private label seller of selling a counterfeit version of their own product, and Amazon will use the same uh, rubber stamp slash pass the buck way of processing that complaint or accusation as they do all, all the safety complaints and all the condition complaints and everything else that we've been hitting our competitors with. Do so any black hats or any 
you know, nefarious consultants who are offering third party services to help people knock off the competitors latched onto this. And they realize that even if it is resolvable, which, you know, most of us know it is ultimately resolvable, um, they can knock you off a listing for at least a few days. Um, it might take Amazon that long just to read what you send and figure out that it's meaningless, uh, a meaningless fake complaint against you and reinstate your listing. So, but on a high velocity product, yeah. that's, that's a serious windfall for the person that stepped up. Yeah, I first saw the spike in, I think it was um, Thanksgiving. So the day before Black Friday, they started timing it. You know, they didn't want to do hit you too early in the week because you might have your listing back up by Thursday or Friday. So they waited until Thanksgiving. Um, I think it was 2018 when I saw a surge of these where a bunch of private label brands contacted me Thanksgiving night saying our listings are down. Um, and of course, they wanted to get them back up for Black Friday and the volumes in that time of year, the volumes of, of seller performance emails and abuse reports and ASIN reinstatement cases is way, way up. So, I mean, it just takes Amazon longer to read and respond anyway at that time of year. And then beyond that, they mishandled a bunch of these appeals. And so people were getting generic messaging back saying, no, this isn't, this isn't what we need to reinstate your listing. And no one was really reading or cared that they were private label products. Like you, you're not selling a fake version of your own product. Um, everyone was so baffled by this. They were sending basic appeals saying, wait a minute, what do you mean? This is a mistake. You made a mistake. There's no counterfeit complaint against us. And it's like, yeah, I know there isn't. That's the problem. A competitor is making one up and buying from you and saying it's fake probably before the item even ships or before they even got it. That's unreal. Or they planned for it right two weeks in advance and they bought from you and then they waited a week and then they said, yeah, this is fake. I just opened it today. What would you, what would you suggest that, uh, maybe a, is there such a thing here as a good defense is a great offense here? Like, is there anything uh, preemptive that you could do? You know, you know, you have a listing, it has some consistent sales. It's probably attractive. What are some things that a private label seller could do? You're the brand owner mm -hmm. to get ahead of this. You have to have all the documentation all, re all ready to go for one thing, which I think more, more sellers understand that now and have that at the ready. But going back a year or two, people would be scrambling for this stuff. I mean, that's lost time and wasted energy. Have the documentation ready, have the letter from your supplier, from your manufacturer ready. Again, talking about your business relationship, what they manufacture for you, what the relationship is there, how long you've been selling those products, what quantities and so forth. And then also information about the supplier themselves, where they're based, a link to their website, um, all that information. So Amazon doesn't give you the runaround about, we can't verify your supplier. You know, they love to say that now. Um, they're overusing and abusing that to deny things. But beyond that, uh, with my long-term clients, we make sure that they have, um, I wouldn't say templates, but correspondence that's drafted and ready to go with maybe slight modifications, pre-written in case you get accused of uh, inauthentic or counterfeit versions of your own products. And not just counterfeit, also for safety complaints. I mean, if you've seen a smattering of what might be coming if you're attacked, what was already left in a product review that somebody else might say, hey, that's a great idea. We'll just rephrase this particular safety complaint they got 11 different ways, buy from them 11 times, and we'll just say it's an unsafe product. Authenticity, safety, everyone knows Amazon's hypersensitive around those two issues. Um, whether it's bad PR or the government re researching things going on, um, you know, or just the volume of contacts they get from sellers complaining about, you know, being unfairly attacked. Uh, Amazon is poised to react whenever, you know, it's kind of like having a hair trigger temper, really. Sure. So you have to be ready for any kind of false accusations that might come your way and be able to disprove them uh, as quickly as possible. Yeah, I, I, I've reacted Again, even with a bunch of experience, you know, Amazon, I'm dealing with an issue where somebody is accusing me of a, uh, maybe they're using a trigger word that they know Amazon bots pick up in a certain category or um, they, they basically, they effectively remove me from my own listing yeah. and the emotions that I feel at that moment. And I think any seller feels clouds your judgment yeah. and you start being very reactive. What, what do you think? Is that something you see that's common among sellers? And if so, what are some of the biggest mistakes you think people make in that first, you know, 12 hours that when they, by the, after they get to you and you're like, oh, why did you do that? Yeah. What are some of those things? 
that still happens a lot and it's usually the anxiety and the emotional response. We don't see it as often because I think over the last three, four years, we've seen sellers understand that including a lot of extraneous content in an appeal, whether it's the seller performance or executive seller relations or any team, notice teams, doesn't get you anywhere. You're just banging your head against the wall. Um, and I've done my best to make sellers understand that if you spam them with a bunch of stuff, they will tune out very quickly. If you send them three or four appeals in rapid succession that are similar to each other, that are agitated, that, that blame them for not reading, you know, you're just digging yourself a deeper hole and you're giving them an excuse to send you the, that's it, you're done. We're not going to respond to further messages um, response. Don't give them any more motivation than they already have to send you that. And they already have that motivation on their side for their own reasons, you know, how quickly they need to review things, the number of investigations per hour someone in sell performance has to do. We could talk about that for days, but on your side, you're not going to get anything out of that raw emotion. It's one out of a hundred or one out of a thousand where you actually strike an emotional chord with somebody who's been trained to behave like a robot when they're reading appeals and, and, and find their inner core humanity and they, they accept everything you wrote in anger and reinstate you. That's, that's random luck. You're not really getting anything out of that. So being pragmatic, being fact focused, even data driven, just the way they're supposed to be and thinking like they do, that's what pays dividends because before you sit down, bang something out hastily that you know has a low percentage chance of success. Instead, you're thinking about what do they need from me in order to consider this enough to accept it, to reinstate it, so that no one will come back and look at them and say, why did you reinstate this guy or woman? Why did you reinstate this ASIN? If it's paper thin, then it's their fault for reinstating you. If you gave them everything they needed in the format required, then you helped them do their job and you experience less pain from the revenue loss and the agony and frustration. So everyone wins and all you have to do is not be hasty, not burn through a bunch of, of appeals because really that's just therapy for you. That made you feel better, but it doesn't make your company or your, or your pocketbook feel better, right? Sure. Um, you mentioned something that's always got my curiosity and since it sort of ties into this, we're talking about what it's like from the seller side of things when something like this happens, you actually, I don't know anybody else, uh, probably except for your team that yeah. knows what it's like from the other side, yeah. that side that I always imagined in a dungeon somewhere with no light <laughs> and like a torture chamber, <laughs> you know what I mean? And maybe just yeah. after years of dehumanizing training, I don't know, but it's obviously not that. What, what does that look like? Like, what is this, what is seller performance? What does it look like from their end when something like this happens? Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're encouraged, unfortunately, to, to move quickly. And they're not necessarily trained or taught to move quickly and efficiently or effectively. Um, and to read the key parts that they need to read and reject the nonsense. I mean, if they were better at reviewing appeals and they weren't just dashing through the work and making obvious errors, we see total inconsistency in their work. We see obvious mistakes all the time right click errors where an ASIN that you're not even selling is mentioned, you know, put in a response back to you. That's just somebody doing low quality work and they don't have a manager checking back up on them um, or even any kind of competent auditing process, which is one of the major flaws that they've got right now. So they're training them to go quickly. You have to train yourself to understand that they're going quickly. So the information has to be easy to read, readily available, not written in some convoluted way formatted the right way. So you've got short, concise bullets in a root causes section and a plan of action or in a, you know, how we immediately resolved past problems. Second section, the third section, of course, is future prevention. Um, sellers are getting better at understanding the format, like the bullets and don't go on for pages, keep it to a page. So no three paragraphs about my mom and pop business and the order. Right. No, no. <laughs> And I still see people putting a huge chunk about stuff like that at the end. I mean, by then they've already made their decision. Don't have a conclusion paragraph. I mean, scratch all that. If it's that important, put it up top um, or build it into the bullets in, the, in one of those three core sections that they want. But um, in terms of thinking like an Amazonian, I mean, you're dealing with people who are reading the same stuff over and over all day. So this is why I am such a, 
advocate for ignoring templates or anything that's generic or cut, not custom written because if you're borrowing a template from another seller, I mean, I understand that's cheaper than hiring me to do it for you. But if you're just assuming that this situation is exactly the same and you send it to an investigator that's read that same template six times that hour or that day, they're going to remember that six other sellers sent them the same exact language, even if you move a few things around. I mean, it's, they've already read something like that. So you're basically standing up and waving, hey, I didn't do my homework. Hey, I didn't take this seriously. Um, I copied and pasted. I didn't research this. I think it's BS and I'm going to give you something generic back because this is stupid and I shouldn't have to go through this exercise. But if you do that, understand the consequences. Who has the power in that situation? Well, they have the power to reinstate your ASIN or deny you or reinstate your account. And you don't have a heck of a lot of power because you've sent them something they can't use. So unless you want to try a low percentage play a bunch of times, hoping for a random hit that they reinstate, and, and you understand that they might eventually stop talking to you, then okay, you understand the consequences, you know what you're up against. But don't do that and take that strategy, which to me is not a strategy at all, and then complain, hey, they never get back to me, or complain like they never read anything, they don't know what they're talking about. You didn't give them anything they could use. So that makes sense yeah. and you mentioned um six plus a day do you happen to know like a rough number of how many you know of these seller performance suspension like uh inf or infringement like stuff is in the queue at any given time and is there a quota that somebody has to hit every day i mean it's thousands in the queues i mean t thousands and thousands of contacts are in the, the queues that we would be talking about here whether it's notice teams or performance or product quality related um I mean, the headcounts increased since I left the company, but so has the level of work. So that's kind of a, a push. Sure. Um, individual investigators, back in the day, we were supposed to do, um, and you know, some of them take two minutes, some of them take 10, 20, whatever. You're supposed to do uh, like 110 a day. Jeez. Or, um, I mean, some people were close to like 60, 70, 80. Um, I, I was quick. I would be able to do them quickly, but... I was also very quick at, at reading them without like, you know, skimming without getting the gist of it or just sort of scamming, scanning over it and uh, leaving huge chunks off to the side. I think that's some of what they're doing now is they're missing key pieces and denying appeals because there's whole parts of it they haven't read at all. Um, there's a difference between reading something quickly and competently and not reading it. Sure. So, um, and, and it's, you know, I, I hesitate to completely blame, you know, there's a lot of people blaming support teams and blaming solid performance rank and file investigators. Um, the people managing them have the power to use different tools or to at least start to use different processes and standard operating procedures. And they have the ability to audit work. Um, maybe there's not enough hours in the day in, in their perspective, but it's the managers that need to change their tunes. It's not so much the rank and file investigators. Well, that makes total sense. I have to admit that previously I was, you know, in, in the Amazon space, there's a lot of people that say, oh, I have this huge advantage in selling private label because my, my husband, my wife, whatever, they lived in China or they're Chinese or something like that. Yeah. I was just like, you know, that's kind of like saying you have the hookup for cigars if you're Cuban. It, it really doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter, right? It's, yeah. it's a little, there's a little bit of BS in there. And I've always known you were one of the good guys, but I was like, he knows his stuff, but is there really a an upper hand by having worked in seller performance, but now being able to speak to you like this here live, because we didn't even cover some of these things previously. Yeah. Uh, I can definitely see where the, it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a whole other subculture almost within seller performance. And if you speak that language, that, that is a, a huge advantage. Yeah. There. You, you know, you're dealing with someone that's overworked. Um, that's huge. Yeah. It's a, it's a particular psychology. Part of it is I'm sure the kinds of people they attract to that kind of work in the beginning when they hire, then it's how they train them. Then it's the behavior that investigators see by the managers around them who are reviewing their work. Then it's the escalation process. I mean, if something gets escalated and they've botched it and they reinstated someone they shouldn't have or reinstated someone prematurely or even denied reinstatement to somebody who had a viable plan of action. If there are people out there like me who understand how to escalate those things and get that decision in front of a higher up, then they're on the clock in terms of, hey, you need to explain, you know, why this 
bad decision of yours resulted in somebody escalating it to another team because this is happening way too much. I mean, to a certain extent, there's so many escalations now, maybe they're numb to it, but there is still a process for that. Otherwise escalations wouldn't uh, you know, functionally perform what we're using them for, which is to get people reinstated from account suspensions. Um, but yeah, I mean, the psychology is there and it's troubling to me that I still, I have, I have a whole service just Review your POA. You could have written it yourself. You might have had somebody else write it for you, whatever. I, I haven't read it uh, yet and I haven't written it for you myself. So just send it to me. And I spent you know, half an hour looking at their POA. I'm still seeing too much POA content that's way off. And with the amount of resources out there about this now, I mean, when I started consulting, what's a plan of action was a, was a question I would start almost every conversation with. Many sellers know what these are now. And just as much as they know about the Jeff email or what executive seller relations is, you know what I mean? So these aren't totally foreign concepts anymore. Sure. But unfortunately, the quality of their written work or the quality of the plan that they put in front of me has only marginally increased in those last three or four years. I'm still seeing subpar content that, that has a 10, 20, 30% chance of success. And that's where sellers need to up their games a little bit. Amazon, of course, they need to up their game. The quality of investigations has been trending down. We all know that. Um, and, and did, I, did I understand that right? That if somebody has a POA that was written by somebody else or whatever, they can send it to you for, you yeah. know, review. Like if they're skeptical and they got this and they're like, wait a minute, I was expecting more light here or more something else, some substance, they can, they can send it to you. Well, a good reason to send it to me if you've hired somebody else to do it is I can pick out the templates very quickly. And sometimes I can tell by the template who you've hired. So I don't even need to ask you who you hired. Um, of course, if you're writing it yourself, then logically that would be different from a lot of templates I've seen unless you're borrowing from a template um, and any seller doing it themselves for the first time, you know, that POA should look different from each other's. But um, the problem becomes if you start borrowing unrelated, you know, I'm suspended for uh, rights owner infringement, but I, I borrowed from a POA that talks a lot about customer service or talks a lot about reviewing my pages for accuracy or uh, for condition complaints. I see all these bullets in a POA that have nothing to do with why they were suspended. Of course, that doesn't have a snowball's chance of being accepted because the investigator knows that you were just grabbing a bunch of generic content and slapping it in there to fill out the page or because you didn't know any better or because you were afraid to write it yourself, whatever the reason, they don't care what the reason is. You've got unrelated content in there and it's, it's not acceptable. So I can pick out those pretty quickly. Um, and I made it, I, I used to have a one hour appointment for like reviewing plans and getting on calls. Now I made it 30 minutes because I've done this so many thousands of times. I can pick out the weaknesses in a POA that quickly. Um, without necessarily saying you need to have me do this and hire me for everything. Some people do, some people don't, but usually I can just give you some pointers and say, rewrite this, show me the final result. Um, their odds have dramatically increased just by my taking a, a look at it and picking the flaws out. And what, um, what is it? And this is the thing most sellers ask. I think when I was a, a, a seller starting off, this was the number one question. And, and as time has gone on, I've learned that, that cheap is expensive sometimes. <laughs> and what does it cost for somebody to do that? Like I've been, I'm trying to imagine someone in my group, they've, mm -hmm. they've gone somewhere else to, to whomever and yep. they got, they're not, they're not a hundred percent behind. However, they may have gone pretty high on their budget and getting it done to begin with. Right. How much is, how much does it cost to connect with you on something like that? Oh, the, the half hour appointments two fifty. Okay. Yeah. And I have a one hour initial consult. I mean, we, we recommend the initial assessment I do for most cases. Some people know all about me or us and want us to begin work immediately. Um, as we time gotta, we gotta connect, we gotta connect for sure. Then <laughs> I mean, as time has gone on, they've started doing more like having account health services call you or they send you, send you a message saying, we're calling you within 24 hours. And then they call you and say, you have set, you're, you're staying active for 72 hours, but you have 72 hours to get us a plan of action. Um, at that point, you essentially need to decide right away, are you doing this yourself? You've got several hours to figure, you can either work on a draft for several hours and then show it to somebody like me who understands the value in that draft, or you can talk to account health services and put your draft in their hands and see what they have to say about it. 
um, they get mixed reviews in terms of the value of their uh, opinions, but um, 72 hours is 72 hours. You have a, they're putting a time limit on it and there isn't a lot of time to mess around like calling a bunch of consultants or uh, I, I want everyone to do their homework and not just make a hasty choice if they're getting professional help with it. But at the same time, you can't call everybody and price everything out. And um, you know, the one hour assessment is usually something I can do for somebody, even if there's no time available on my calendar, I just tell them to pick another date and time and shoot me an email saying, Hey, I only have 72 hours for this and you weren't free for a couple of days. Can you do it later today? I usually accommodate that. All right. Cause I, I want to be respectful of your time, but there was yeah. one thing you said earlier that I, I guess this is more from the personal, me personally mm -hmm. wanting to know this, you mentioned um, like the hiring process to get someone on seller performance. Yeah. What, um, what is that? Like, do you know if they're, what, what, the, what is the criteria to get, I, I want to, you know, Amazon wants to hire someone to, you know, work on the seller performance team. What, what is that criteria? Yeah. What skills do you need to have? And it's changed a bit over the years. Um, back when I was doing it, we were getting into having certain language skills were needed in Seattle. Um, I speak French, so they wanted me to work on Amazon France in addition to uh, language-based cues, which for me ended up being a split between UK and US. Um, so on one level, they wanted to know, do you speak you know, Italian, German, French, Spanish, uh, different languages, because that was an added benefit. But I mean, aside from the language skill part, they wanna know that you think critically and you have a good analytical mind to understand what kind of appeal can be accepted. You don't want to accept a bunch of promises and just be gullible and believe whatever a, a seller tells you. Um, sometimes they can prove what you need them to prove. If you need proof of legitimate sourcing of a product, there, there's documented proof you can get. But for other kinds of issues, you're kind of taking them at their word at what they wrote in the plan of action that they have taken those steps. Um, you're not visiting their factory or their warehouse necessarily and looking at what they're doing. You're not calling them necessarily to talk through the entire plan of action to say, prove to me you really took this preventative action. I mean, you're kind of looking at the quality. You're still years later looking at the quality of the plan of action and deciding, does this ring true? Is this credible? Have they, does it sound like they've taken this step? Does it sound like they know how to take this kind of specific measure to remedy this kind of problem? Because if it sounds like you're just doing a snow job and, and trying to BS your way through, I can't say this enough. Like I read so many of these every single day, uh, six days a week that I just, I could tell if somebody was making something up or borrowing content from somewhere else, you develop a third sense and you know, it doesn't ring true. Do, do you get access to additional data on a seller's account while you're evaluating say their POA? I mean, really, you're going through their account history. And you could look also, this is another thing I should bring up, make sure you're not reusing too many past plans of action. Because if you only slightly modified something you sent them before, that worked. I mean, this is going to sound like self advertising, but I've got some people who hired me like two years ago or a year ago, and they get suspended for something else. And they try to modify what I wrote for them. Um, and they, and I, you know, what, what do I ask when they say they're suspended? I say, well, show me the POA that you sent them if you sent them anything. And I start reading it. And I'm like, oh, this is just a modified version of what I wrote for them a year ago. So, um, which is fine. I understand the, the attempt and why they want to try it, but you know, it's not one size fits all. Um, you have to, you have to know what parts to modify. And if it's a totally different kind of suspension, you kind of have to start from the beginning and, and do some, do some homework on where this came from. Um, so, I mean, th keep in mind that investigators are reading the same stuff all the time. They're talking about it in the meetings. If there's an escalation that you sent to their boss or somebody above their boss and that person says, Oh, this was worked on by so-and-so and they kick it back down to you. You know, that investigator is going to go through what you sent them and, and have to explain why they did or didn't do what they did on your account. So. It makes sense. Um, I, again, there's so many different things. I, I feel like I could ask you questions for hours, especially behind the scenes on the air quotes again, evil seller performance. <laughs> um, I'll uh, eventually be in Florida. I haven't gone for a month or two, but when this all blows over, I'll, I'll be down there in person. And Oh yeah. My group's dying to see you there. Um, I definitely treat you to food and drinks afterwards <laughs> so we can uh, uh, try to get as much information as we can out of you. 
Um, yeah, no, I mean, I'm a Florida fan. I'm looking forward to being on there, down there on a regular basis, whether it's quarterly, maybe not monthly, but quarterly. And, um, and even just podcasts or, you know, remote um, work is something I'm very used to. So we can always uh, do this, do this again, because this is important information. Fantastic. And we, we touched mostly on just like rights ownership, IP mm -hmm. claims, whether it's real or fake, but, and the entire process there. But you, you know and cover and help sellers with a lot more than that. Uh, what's the best way that somebody listening to this that realizes, okay, you know, Chris is the best thing since peanut butter. This is who I got to work with. <laughs> How does somebody, what's the easiest way to get a hold of you that they don't get, you know, buried under the other hundreds of people that are contacting? Yeah, I mean, I have a contact form, a big orange text on my website, ecommercechris.com. Um, that's a good place if you have to show me a certain amount of information to get me familiar with what's going on with the problem before we even email or talk. Um, and then you can also... Um, since we're probably going to be talking again, um, email direct to me, chris at ecommercechris.com is fine as well. Um, and be, feel free to just slap into the subject line that, that Carlos sent you or you're a member of the group. Um, you know, Carlos takes this material seriously and so do I. So I'm happy to, uh, I'm, I'm considered pretty responsive and I'm happy to jump on it as quickly as possible. I appreciate that, Chris. Chris, thank you so much for coming on to the show. I look forward to having you again real soon. And I'll let you enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thanks, Carlos. Take care. Have an awesome one. <laughs> Liked what you heard and want to stay connected? Join our Facebook group or find me anywhere on social media at Wizards of Amazon or text the word Amazon to 69922.